Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the impact of the just completed legislative session on cities and towns. We'll hear about a relatively new form of literature that focuses on climate change, and we'll learn about volunteer efforts to help manage a national forest. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The recent state legislative session continued to trend toward preempting local control at the city and county level in favor of what lawmakers see as statewide concerns. Here to talk about the session and its impact on state municipalities is Ken Strobeck, Executive Director of the Arizona League of Cities and Towns. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ted. Uh, overall impact on Arizona cities and towns. You know, it was a very busy session, a lot of bills that we had to work on a lot, but overall, I think uh, that turned out fairly good for cities and towns. Uh, there were some impacts that, uh, that we're not real happy with, but overall could have been a lot worse. What are the ones you're not too happy with? Uh, there are several. Um, one of them that we're not delighted about, but my board early on said we'll take a, de a deal, was uh, $10.7 million to pay for some operations of the Department of Revenue. And this is kind of continuing a trend that's happened over the last few years of asking local governments to pay for more and more state uh, agency operations. So our, my board agreed to do that. In the past, we've actually sued over those kinds of demands, but this time we said we've made a lot of changes to the TPT system. We understand DOR has a lot of pressure. If we can do an MOU kind of arrangement that says we're paying a fee for a certain service, we'll, we'll go along with that. And I know that the, we've had a couple of debates on these uh, kinds of topics, the local tax on home rentals. That was a big one for cities and that did not make it. Uh, your concern, obviously the concerns are there. Yes, oh yeah, absolutely. Those kind of preemptions and, and again a, a bill that was introduced really without any kind of policy discussion. There wasn't any task force or any report that said this is something that needs to be done and it would have had an impact of $90 million to cities and towns in Arizona. And a, an amazing amount of money just for one policy bill just because somebody said well let's eliminate that tax. You know, that would be a nice idea. Without understanding the context of our, our system of financing local government is really primarily based on sales tax rather than on property tax as it is in many other states. So this came out of the blue and, and it took a, a Herculean effort to, to defeat that one. And I was going to say some of the smaller uh, cities and towns in the state which are normally pretty conservative when it comes to these kinds of things they were said, you can't do this to us. Absolutely. I mean, this is a tax that's been on the books for more than 40 years. It's one that has kind of grown up with the, the state, especially as we have multi-housing apartment buildings and all these kinds of complexes. Uh, this is a, a very key part of how we fund local government. What about the, uh, the ban on city bans on plastic bags? That was one that, uh, that ultimately got through the legislature and I assume the governor will sign that. That had a couple of uh, provisions having to do with an energy reporting. I'm not really sure what that was all about. But, and then also a ban on containers and uh, you know, uh, styrofoam containers and plastic bags that basically says cities and towns can't pick and choose to ban those. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as though the argument is, especially from cities and towns, is that there's a disconnect on state lawmakers just even understanding how local governments work. Is that accurate? I think it is very accurate and in part it's because so many people get involved in the legislative process who haven't ever gone through a local government process. They not, have not served on a school board or, or at the local city or town council and so they get to the state legislature and they're approached by you know special interest groups and, and lobbying groups that say wouldn't it be great if we stop the cities from doing this or that so they introduce bills and, and try to pass them through without understanding that you know what works in one city doesn't always work in another city that there's a lot of difference as you cross the state. And uh, we think that most of those kinds of decisions should be locally made rather than dictated at the state level. And yet many of the bills, as we kind of mentioned in the intro here, uh, matter of statewide concern was right. the quote that we saw on many right. of these bills. This seems to be an increasing tendency. It's, it's been around for a number of years, but I think it is increasing. I just uh, clipped a few uh, bills just before I came over. Property rights are a matter of statewide concern. The sale, use, and disposition of auxiliary containers is a matter of statewide concern. The regulation of retail business is a matter of statewide concern. So the, the, uh, the legislators often go to the, the lawyers and the lawyers say, well, put this in in case you're sued so we can say it really is a matter of statewide concern. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. But how much say should the state have on local decisions? 
Well, again, that, it's always going to be a matter of pull and tug. Uh, you know, at the local level, we say don't tread on us, and at the state level, they say, well, we're the uh, the higher government. We can tell you what to do. So there's always going to be a bit of give and take. But when it gets into some really micromanagement of the local government decision making, I think that's when it crosses the line. And there's there's always going to be debate over where that line is. And as far as uh, I noticed that you were concerned with inserting punishment into legislation. Is yeah. this a newer trend? I think it's an increasing trend uh, that if you don't do what the law says, then we are not only going to have the attorney general or the county attorney file charges against you, we'll also put in statute that you will be fined a certain amount, that you can't use public resources to defend yourself, that you can be removed from office. We're seeing more and more of those kinds of uh, sort of substituting for the the uh, judiciary, putting those into state statutes, and and we had several examples of that this year on the gun bills, on on other bills that that uh, affected city uh, officials. And that guns in public building uh, bill that failed. Your thoughts on that particular legislation? Twenty three twenty. That was an interesting one because it's a little different than the uh, guns in public buildings bills that uh, Governor Brewer vetoed for the last three years. This one sort of made a distinction between the uh, common man and somebody that has a CCW permit, a concealed carry weapons permit. And it said that you couldn't ban somebody from bringing a weapon in if they had a CCW permit. That's a little different than saying you can't have any kind of ban whatsoever. So that was a little different, uh, but it still would have required any uh, city or any actually state or county that wanted to ban guns in a particular building would have required staff, uh, screeners, lockers, and all those things, an enormous cost. Uh, estimated over $130,000 per entrance per, entrance. per year, yes. and that would be, have been ongoing. So with all this in mind, um, and again, we're, we're kind of seeing a trend, we're kind of seeing things moving in a certain direction, what does the league say to, I'm a lawmaker, what do you say to me when I say, yeah, but the state wants this done, and the state does have control over municipalities. You know what? It, uh, well, the state, in a, in a way, does. In a way, it doesn't. Uh, the The Constitution says that charter cities do have some authority. Right. Uh, uh, but but there's always going to be that uh, argument, that discussion. What I would say to lawmakers is, go back and talk to the mayors and the council members in your district. Ask them what they think about these particular laws. And maybe some of them would say, we like this you know, set of laws and we don't care for these, this set of laws. I think what they need to do is respond more to the constituents that they are representing rather than to the special interest groups that come and approach them. All right. Good stuff. Good to see you again. Thank you so much Thanks. for joining us. Thanks, Ted. Climate fiction, or cli-fi, is a growing literary genre that imagines how climate change and other environmental concerns will shape human narratives of the future. And here with more on climate fiction is Manana Milkerite, a postdoctoral research fellow with ASU's Walton Sustainability Fellowship Program, and Clark Miller, a senior sustainability scientist in the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Give me a better definition of climate fiction. Climate fiction is a currently exploding uh, genre of literature that deals with climate change and the impacts of climate change. Give me an example of a cli-fi story. There are lots of good examples because the diversity of stories is, is really broad. I think the majority of them deals with um, or a story set in the future that is climatically changed. But it's stories about humans who are basically living out their 
struggles and conflicts in a changed future. But many of them are also about, uh, let's say, extreme weather events, floods and storms that are already associated with climate change and deal with that kind of dystopian or horror scenario. But there are also stories about the, f the present, where uh, people right now have to struggle with the issues of, is climate change actually real? Like Barbara Kingsolver's flight behavior, for example, is a story of a community in Tennessee, or uh, Michael Crichton's state of fear is asking the question if climate change is real at all. And is, uh, compare now climate fiction with post-apocalyptic fiction, dystopian fiction. I mean, are, we, are they one and the same to a certain degree? So I think this is a great question because I, the, to me, the reality is the reason we're seeing this is because society is confronting a significant challenge like atomic bomb. Uh, the atomic bomb was a significant challenge in the post-war era. And so we are pre seeing precisely the same response in the literary community grappling with this phenomenon. What does it mean? What kinds of futures might we inhabit? And so there are a lot of similarities in some of the literature uh, as well, although science fiction itself has evolved as a genre too. And so you get others like Orson Scott Card's Past Watch, which is uh, more about redemption and finding ways to address these big issues rather than simply being post-apocalyptic. I was going to say, it, doesn't ha it has to be plausible. It doesn't have to be cynical, does it? Or does that help with the narrative? Uh, it doesn't have to be cynical, no. I'm, it, it, it helps if it's plausible. Um, <laughs> Although I think, to me, the, the major issue is the desire to explore these, these big questions that we're confronting about what kind of society will we live in. So one of the best examples is Paolo Bacigalupi's The Wind-Up Girl, which is really about how are we going to live, how are we going to get energy in a world where we can't use fossil fuels. And so there's a lot of animals coming back. There's a lot of turning of agricultural crops into uh, energy. And it's a, so it's a very interesting exploration of, of this future that's not really dystopian. Can these kinds of stories foster some sort of public change, social change? That's a really interesting question. I think that is the key question that we are interested in in the work that we're doing. Um, I think it's a it's a bit of an of an overblown argument to uh, to suggest that climate fiction might change societies, but I think uh, as Clark already mentioned, it is a potentially s a really great tool to explore possible futures uh, in a, in a way that is very different than reading a climate science report. Uh, through the characters and the stories, you enter into a, a kind of a future that might be possible, and the diversity of stories gives you uh, a broad range of possible futures or narratives that helps people think through what it might feel like, what it might be like to be in a world that's not only climatically changed, but that also has brought about technological changes or social changes that come with a changed climate. So it, I think it helps people put themselves into the future as a kind of a cognitive emotional time machine, if you will, uh, a, a simulator of what the world might look like. Uh, but how do you get past just the escapism tendencies of science fiction in general. I mean, it's one thing to be woo woo. It's another thing to say this is this is dealing with something that is right here on the ground and could become worse in time. Yeah, and we see uh, a whole spectrum of writing. Uh, so there's no question that there are authors who are taking this and sensationalizing it, uh, trying to figure out how am I going to have the next number one bestseller. Uh, novel that everybody wants to read, uh, all, all the way through to the other end of the spectrum where you have, uh, you know, novelists who are really trying to, um, trying to uh, engage some of the deep themes of human environment interactions, human nature, mm -hmm. relationships. Uh, in ways that are, you know, reminiscent of long histories of, of human literature, going back to, for example, the story of Noah in the Bible. Yeah. Right? And coming sure. back, the significance of that coming back in the recent film and Indeed. so forth. Uh, okay. Who is the typical cli-fi reader? Uh, I would say anybody. I would think, for example, here in Arizona, it will be 
really interesting to wait for the upcoming book by Paolo Bacigalupi, The Water Knife, which is about a future water war between Phoenix and Vegas. Oh so boy. As, as, right. as one result of climate change, water is a, is a big topic, so readers here might actually want to pick that up, but readers elsewhere might want to pick up other books like Nathaniel Rich's Art Against Tomorrow, which is about floods. You have different effects of, of climate change that are relevant for different people, so they might want to look for something that is more apt for them. But are you seeing most of the readers uh, young, young adult, old science fiction aficionados kind of moving sideways a little bit? Um, there is a, a big subgenre within climate fiction that is for young adults, but I, I don't think that's uh, very specific to that. So there's a broad range. I wouldn't say there's a, an age restriction for climate fiction. Yeah, no age restriction, but what are the tendencies? What are you seeing out there? Uh, we really see, I mean, I, I think Manana's right. We see a, a, a great diversity because what we're seeing is writers from these different generations who are really targeting different generations all writing about this. So you get someone like Bachi Galupi, who is one of the rising young stars in the field and has attracted, I mean, many of his books are specifically for young adults. But then you have writers like Kim Stanley Robinson, who's been around for decades and is, you know, himself a baby boomer, and his audience is mostly baby boomers, and, and, and he's written about this as well. So, you know, I, I think you're seeing what we take it as more than anything is a signal that climate change has left the realm of the scientists and is now something that everyday people are beginning to engage with and, and ask you know, what is this future we've committed ourselves to? Where are we taking our societies? What might we want to do about it? And climate fiction is not going to answer those questions, but it, it, it is, you know, the willingness of people to pick up a book and read about it uh, is, is a signal that they're taking it seriously. And the Imagination and Climate Futures Initiative, very quickly, what was that? What is that? Well, we've created that uh, about a year ago to deal with the big question of what is the role of imagination in society's responses to climate change, or what is the role of the absence of imagination. And climate fiction is, a, I think, a wonderful tool to explore the imagination, to build our imagination, to, to strengthen it in order to allow us to discuss those big questions and grapple with the challenges of, of climate change, using a, also a fun tool uh, that is not as often as serious and, and dreadful as reading an IPCC report. So in that sense, it, it, it offers a great opportunity to start those conversations and, and, and involve a much broader uh, group of stakeholders and interested people in that. All right, very good. Uh, water knife, that's what I got to watch out for, the water All knife? Right. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. Very interesting stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You, Thank you. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at arizonahorizon at asu.edu.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Sustainability looks at Friends of the Tonto National Forest, a new volunteer group focused on helping promote and maintain the Tonto National Forest. Joining us now are Carrie Templin of the Tonto National Forest and Art Wartz, president of the Friends Group. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Real quickly, for those who aren't familiar, where is the Tonto National Forest? The Tonto National Forest is north and east of Phoenix. So if you've ever gone to Payson or to Roosevelt or Saguaro Lake, or if you've ever been on the Lower Salt, you've been on the Tonto National Forest. And the challenges as far as uh, natural and, and cultural resource management, these sorts of things, what kind of challenges are faced out there? Oh, we have lots of challenges. As the city grows and, and people go and enjoy their natural resources, um, we have more and more use and it's harder and harder for us to keep up with all of the things we need to do and all the maintenance we would like to be doing to keep the area as beautiful as we want it to be. And thus, the Friends Group, how did this Friends Group get started? Well, this Friends Group is relatively new. It's only been for, together for a few months now, but uh, volunteer, volunteerism, working with the, the different groups, have been for years and years and years. And uh, it's just in more recently, though, as we have more and more problems and, and less funding, uh, we've been looking at different ways of getting more volunteers working in hand in hand with the uh, uh, Tonto National Forest. By way of certain projects and, and and these sorts of things, outings, public information? Most all of those and the, the typical projects people look at, they look at cleanup projects and they look at a lot of different projects like that. But we're looking at a lot of new projects and there's a lot of different things that uh, volunteers can do that have never been used before. And so we're exploring that. We're getting uh, input from volunteers and we're also identifying things that we can do to help the National Forest. Were these things that the National Forest Service was once able to do on its own and what happened? Well, and the riparian photo point is, is a very good example. That program has been going on for like the last 25 years. But it's been within the last year or two that we've no longer been able to maintain doing the photo points every single year. We just don't have enough staff and enough funding. So the volunteer group, the Friends of the Tano, have volunteered to take that program over for us and maintain those photo points, which are critical to us to be able to demonstrate the health of the riparian areas. And we're looking right now at the Seven Mile Wash. Talk to us about what a photo point project is and what the goal is. Well, essentially it's monitoring a piece of land over a period of time. And it's, it would be taking a picture uh, of the current conditions and then coming back a year later taking another picture and determining has it changed for the better, for the worse, has it stayed the same, or what are the conditions? So what is Seven Mile, well, well we, can you go back to Seven Mile Wash for a second here? Because I want to ask you what, from from what we saw of that, what is that telling you, those, those pictures there? Well, those pictures are showing that there's improvement and, and a lot of times there's uh, some changes that have been made uh, related to either uh, management of, of grazing or, or other different changes and also if there is effect of a drought condition, which we've had drought conditions on mm -hmm. there, uh, right now we're getting a little bit of improvement in the past few years so we're seeing some of the improvements on there. And the measurement tied in with riparian areas which are adjacent to water sources, it's, it's a way of measuring the health of the forest. And this again, the Forest Service had done these, this seven mile wash and the other projects, these photo point projects, had been doing them for quite a while uh, and they've got to continue because it's a, that looks like a valuable resource. It's a very valuable tool for us to be able to demonstrate the health of the forest and the health of those riparian areas. And one of the things that Art didn't talk about is with that is that a lot of people don't realize that those riparian areas lead into all those lakes that we talked about earlier which is the drinking supply for Phoenix. Indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, so how many volunteers are there? How many friends are there? And how does one become a friend? It, it's a new organization. There's currently about 30 people that have, have signed up on there, but there, we know there are thousands out there that, that have interest in it. Uh, we have a website. I'm sure you're showing the, the website on there. We like people to go in and look at that website and if they have interest to contact us. Not, not with just the projects that uh, they think they would have, but ones that may, maybe they'd like to get involved with or some that, you know, I, I've always liked to, to do this type of project. Fine, bring it up and we'll look at things and we'll talk it over with the forest and see if that's possible. How do you make sure that the friends are qualified to be friends? <laughs> well, we're lucky enough that we have very um, talented people that are, or, that are heading up this um, group that we've worked with for years. So we know them, we know that they'll do 
the projects and we will work with them hand in hand to make sure that the projects that are taken on um, benefit the forest and benefit the volunteer group. And as far as coordination and consultation between the Forest Service and the group, how much is there? Oh, well, there's often. I mean, I attend their meetings, which they have monthly, but beyond that, we have phone calls and visits often between those two points. So we are back and forth all the time with what's going on. And very quickly, the future of the, what, what, do, you, what do you want to see here in the next few years as far as the Friends? We'd like to see the organization build and get involved with a lot more different projects, particularly in areas like uh, e equestrian. There's a lot of people that, that ride horses on the National Forest and, and uh, they may be able to go out and identify problems with some of our trails that we don't have people in the National Forest available, but they can uh, go out and identify those problems. Or recreational shooting, same type of thing. So we're looking at a lot of different groups. Uh, we'd like to get involved with them and we'd like to have them contact us. All right, good information. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. The Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability is the heart of sustainability at ASU, advancing research, education, and business practices for an urbanizing world. You can learn more at sustainability.asu.edu tv.